Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar with Giant. Decoding PIYE solutions, PEO umbrella and beyond. We're going to give everyone a couple of minutes to join because we've got some big numbers joining us today, which is really exciting. Uh, I'm based down in Essex and today the weather is actually really, really lovely, although the days are getting shorter and we are progressing towards autumn. Um, I'm looking forward to that actually. I'm looking forward to feeling cosy and going on some autumnal walks. Um, what about you, Michael? Are you looking forward to autumn? Yeah, unfortunately, you're right, Betty. <clears throat> the nights are drawing in um, and the dreaded Christmas countdown will be on soon. So uh, best make the most of it while we can. Chris, you're actually uh, you're actually escaping the UK tomorrow, aren't you? Where are you off to? And I'm going over to uh, to Croatia, so delaying the inevitable drawing in of the the nights and the weather for for another week. So that being said, I did enjoy getting out with the dog this morning to see uh, to see the autumn dew on the grass. So I, I can't complain. Autumn's probably my favourite season, to be fair. Fair enough. Hope that the audience are also mirroring our enthusiasm. Um, if anyone has anything that's their favourite thing about autumn, feel free to tell us in the chat. It's really nice to hear from you, even if it's a little bit trivial. Um, as we're working from home, it's nice to have some audience engagement. Um, and throughout the session, we'll also be taking your questions. Um, I think we're letting everyone filter in, but while we let them do that, we will start the session. So. Michael and Chris, um, can you introduce yourselves today as our key speakers? Thanks, Betty. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm Michael Howard, um, head of agency sales here at Giant Group. Um, I, I suppose looking at the audience uh, for today, um, I've definitely uh, spoken to a couple, met with a number of people previously over the last 14 years working in the industry. Um, main sort of requirement here at Giant is helping recruitment businesses navigate through a variety of legislative changes to ensure that compliance and maintain profitability. Um, also, um, I head up our agency sales team to ensure that our recruitment partners have access to the full range of Giant Group services. Thanks, Michael. I'm uh, I'm Christopher Walsh. I work inside the team that Michael's part of and look after the account management and business development teams. Um, I myself have, have operated in the space for eight years across now three of the biggest five organisations. Um, and we look after obviously agencies, as Michael's mentioned, regards to support from payroll solutions uh, across the board, really. Thanks so much. And I'm Betty Underwood. I work here at Giant on the marketing team specialising in events and I'll be your host for today. Um, so without further ado, let's begin our webinar. This webinar will be on decoding PAYE solutions, PEO, Umbrella and beyond. Today we're going to discuss PEO, Umbrella, PAYE, IR35 fee payer, employer of record. What are they? Why are they different and who are they for? So firstly, Chris, can I come to you first to introduce us to PEO? Of course, thanks, Betty, for the uh, for the introduction. So PEO stands for Professional Employer Organisation. It's a type of full service human resource outsourcing. But unlike other external HR services, a PEO becomes the employer of record for the client's employees. It's also known as a co-employment arrangement. In the arrangement, the PEO performs various employee administration tasks, such as payroll and benefits administration, on behalf of the business. Some PEOs also have strategic services, but no two are exactly alike. So it's important to research providers and compare their capabilities. The aim of a PEO is to handle the complexities of human resource management on behalf of their client, so that the business owner can focus on their core operations. Common HR services provided include worker onboarding and screening, salary and benefits, compliance, development of policies, employee performance evaluation, the handling of payroll and tax responsibilities, and the storage of documentation and information. Amazing, thank you for that. Can you also run us through some of the benefits of PEO? 
Of course, so um, first of all, you've got your time saving. So PEO can give you back precious time um, for you to look after your clients and, and for us, for our clients. Um, this is by handling time consuming in HR admin tasks such as payroll processing, benefits administration and tax compliance, which then in turn leads to cost efficiencies. So by pooling together multiple clients, PEO can offer more cost effective employee benefits, insurance plans and other HR services to their clients. Small businesses in particular can benefit from lower rates that will be difficult for them to secure independently. This allows business owners and their employees to redirect the time and resources, including deployment for payroll teams towards core operations and strategic initiatives. Then there's the compliance. So keeping up, of course, with the ever evolving landscape of employment law and tax regulations can be complex and time consuming for businesses by partnering with the PEO. A business can rely on the PEO's technical HR expertise to ensure that they comply with relevant regulations, reducing the risk of legal issues and penalties. PEOs often also offer en enhanced employee benefits packages, which include private health insurance and pension schemes, again helping business attract and retain their top talent. This can be particularly important for businesses looking to compete with larger companies in the job market. As businesses grow or experience fluctuations in their workforce, PEOs can adapt their services accordingly and provide full scalability. This flexibility allows businesses to adjust their level of engagement with the PEO as required so that they can continue a long term partnership with a HR support system that ultimately matches their needs. Thanks for that, Chris. Could you now get into the nitty gritty and explain to us how they actually work? So in a PEO arrangement, a close employment relationship is established between the PEO, the client company who are the employer and the employees. The PEO then becomes the employer of record for the client or agency's temporary workers and then assumes certain employment responsibilities on behalf of the client. However, this doesn't mean that businesses up the supply chain hand over complete control to the PEO. A PEO doesn't make decisions on worker pay rates or assignment schedules and doesn't help with the business operations such as sales or marketing, for example. PEO's fees are typically based on a percentage of payroll throughput, a set weekly timesheet fee per worker, but some also charge on the total number of employees. Amazing, thank you. And what administrative services can PEO providers support with? So they can provide a range of administrative services and you can also leverage the latest HR software and expertise to streamline these processes for their clients. PEO payroll is a common service which include processing pay runs and paying PAYE and national insurance. They can manage employee benefit administration tasks, providing a choice of schemes, again, including health insurance, pension schemes and other perks on behalf of the client. They can take on responsibilities related to HR compliance and risk management, and they must stay informed on changes in employment law and regulations to ensure that client companies remain compliant with the latest requirements. PEOs can also provide employee relations support and assist in directly managing employee relationships, addressing HR inquiries and providing support in such areas such as conflict resolution and also performance management. Finally, they onboard and offboard and provide full support here. They can offer also support with recruitment, hiring processes, the onboarding of new employees, as well as offboarding support as well. This may include pre-employment screening checks, orientation programmes and exit interviews as well. In terms of the payroll, under PEO workers are quoted their actual gross pay rate from the start, as opposed to their assignment rate via umbrella PAYE. This never changes unless the pay rate changes as well. There are no deductions other than normal PAYE employee tax and employees NI. There is no invoice reconciliation required and pay slips are therefore very easy to follow for the workers. The solution as a result is often viewed as a much cleaner alternative to umbrella PAYE. 
the employer of record remains the PEO provider and they invoice employer statutory costs, including employer pension, employer NI, and apprenticeship levy back up the chain to the client or agency they are the supplier to. This is done on either a weekly or monthly basis, dependent on the payment schedule set with the workers and or the end hire. So of course it's useful to understand the theory, but also great to have a practical example in terms of a case study. So we've recently worked with an employment business to directly support them on a new client's contractual requirements. This is for workers deemed inside R35 to be paid PAYE, but not via umbrella. The agency didn't offer their own in-house PAYE solution, and they didn't realize that they could outsource this requirement to Giant. We set them up with a fully outsourced PEO solution in 10 days, whereby they can onboard their workers directly onto our PEO portal. It's allowed them to secure the client as a sole supplier and save them an increase in overheads and internal resource to focus on the client's requirements instead. We're actually seeing more and more agencies who operate typically in finance, pharma, energy, chemical manufacturing, have this flow down stipulated in their contractual terms. It's worth noting that agencies who already have their own in-house PAYE payroll can migrate large existing populations from their own agency PAYE to PEO and outsource this requirement to reduce overheads, increase cash flow, and ultimately redeploy their internal resources on re revenue generating operations instead. Amazing. Thank you so much for those insights. At this point in the webinar, I'm just going to remind everyone, please feel free to use the chat or Q&A functions if you want to submit anonymous questions as well. Um, yeah, we'll be happy to answer any at the end. So coming over to you now, Michael, can you please introduce us to Agency Payroll? Yeah, thanks, Betty. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, Agency payroll or agency PAYE um, is an option for workers to get paid. Um, should the worker maybe anti umbrella or, or may not have the opportunity to go as a limited company, potentially down to the I-35 changes uh, a few years ago. Agency PAYE is probably the most common payroll option when you review the entire temporary market. Somewhat different to that of the contract market, um, this is due to mainly job roles, pay rates, length of assignment and, and typical type of worker. Agency PAYE is typically a model used for workers who may be on short term assignments and don't want or feel the need for any added value or added benefits that usually comes with working with another PAYE model that Chris and I have either have or will be discussing today, as well as the potential um, costs that are associated with it. Agency payroll is a model generally aimed towards the lower payroll um, community and potential sectors such as education or medical. Thus meaning that the workers are getting paid from the employment business directly who sourced and placed the worker into the role without adding an additional layer or complexity to the supply chain. The benefits of getting paid via the agency directly is that it doesn't usually come with any additional management or administration cost, or also known if you're in the umbrella world as a retained margin. Meaning that this could potentially have um, a slightly different level of take home pay. In some cases, a lot of these types of workers are very driven by the pounds and pence, what they take home rather than any other added value that other solutions can bring. Workers who get paid via the agency payroll also get a much simplified version of the payslip compared to that of some other PAYE models that we're talking about today. If you um, have seen a PAYE payslip and you're on the webinar today, you will see that it's very similar to that of yours and ours that we get paid through our employer today. And typically that payslip is gross pay, the hourly rate times the number of hours worked, employees NI, PAYE tax and then net pay. Um, with other PAYE models that Chris and I are talking about today, there's usually another um, type of deduction or, 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 or inclusion on that payslip, whereas the PAYE model is very, very simplified. Examples we are working 
with an agency where they want to outsource their workers to a PAY engagement. Um, recently, um, it is some agencies may not want to have an in-house PAY solution. Um, you've got additional costs, additional resource, potential technology challenges. And if we also have a look and link this into um, Labour's recent manifesto, um, having workers on your payroll, if you're an agency on the webinar today, you may also involve quite a lot of challenges over the coming months, potential day one employment rights, uh, right to request contracts that match the workers, actual hours that have been worked and reclassification of worker status. So we're historically having workers on your payroll may not be as such as a burden or a cost or a risk. Um, there is likely um, pending changes due to the Labour announcement later back end of October to be mindful of um, and with the likes of Giant being able to support businesses and outsource their PAYE responsibilities, there's also angles here for Giant to be able to mitigate and manage some of that PAYE risk that you may well be inheriting um, later this year or into the, 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 the new year. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, could you then explain what PAYE umbrella is? Yeah, thanks, Betty. Um, I suppose for those that are on the webinar today um, and have been in the umbrella world for a number of years, this is possibly the most common um, type of payroll engagement um, for, for contractors, not to be confused with the temporary market as a whole. Um, but if you're in that contract um, area and arena, since a number of legislative changes over the past number of years, I think the umbrella market has definitely um, increased in volume significantly. If we, if we take a step back in time, um, back in 2007, um, feels like it was yesterday actually, but um, NSC legislation was brought in um, and this saw a huge increase in workers engaged in either running their own limited company or, as we're talking about PAY, seeing a huge increase in umbrella engagements. Um, Giant's growth in this space has continued throughout the last 17 years um, and I think since the introduction of how we see umbrella companies today, there's a number of reasons why workers choose this model. Um, before the travel and subsistence changes, um, there was a lot of workers who didn't want to run their own business and wanted to opt for an engaged uh, umbrella solution where they would get travel and subsistence tax relief. Um, this was kind of your halfway house between pays you earn on the agency payroll and being a self-employed limited company. They would get some flexibility in terms of tax relief without having the responsibility of running their own business. Contractors of today who may want to engage with umbrella companies may want to do so because they may have multiple assignments throughout the year. Um, they would want to remain with that same umbrella company as this would show continued employment and give the worker better or enhanced credit rating for things like mortgages and credit cards. Workers will also want to maintain the current umbrella employer, potentially down to uh, pension requirements. So certain umbrella companies may well have certain arrangements with pension providers. And if they're having to move umbrella company with each assignment, that could have an impact on the tax efficiency and the pension contributions. In certain sectors uh, where contractors would be deployed for a day shift, um, potentially medical or educational, um, Utilising an umbrella company would very much streamline the workers' payroll, meaning that it would only be one employer um, and all of the assignment income would be within the one umbrella and that company would then be responsible for paying the worker. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be multiple employment businesses paying the worker as this would um, have an impact on the workers' tax position. Amazing, thank you for that. Um, could you now go on to explain IR35 fee payer if possible and what the benefits are to that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Betty. Um, I think IR35 fee payer can also be no sort of noted as a deemed payroll. Um, there's quite a number of ways people can obviously call different things in the industry, but ultimately what this solution is, it's been born out of the I-35 changes back in 2017. Um, if you were around on the webinar back then, um, huge changes in the public sector, mainly the NHS had big changes, um, Transport for London, um, and, and also local councils um, saw a huge change in the way that they engage with contingent workers. 
And this i35 fee slash deemed PAYE model was kind of a, an alternative solution for, for certain types of workers. Um, and it will only be for certain individual circumstances that this model would be beneficial for workers. I'm going to talk you through some benefits for this solution and why agencies employment business also utilize this model as well. Um, for those that haven't come across I-35 fee payer or the deemed model solution, this is a solution that still allows workers to engage via their own limited company for inside I-35 roles. Um, yeah, for inside I-35 roles, because I think the perception is, oh, the roles inside I-35, you have to go umbrella or you have to go pay as you earn. Well, this model is, is an alternative to that. And it also still meets the requirement of PAY deductions being made. So I'll talk you through some of the benefits. And um, like Betty's mentioned, if anybody's got any questions on this model or any model that Chris and I have mentioned throughout today's webinar, please do uh, put that in the chat box uh, throughout the webinar. Um, so ultimately, this I-35 fee payer model means that workers can work via their own limited company for inside I-35 roles and not have to put the limited company to dormancy or close it down or um, you know, have impacts on, 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 on the limited company they may have had for a number of years. Worker status um, may well still re remain as self-employed. However, tax status for this worker based on the assignment will be on a, a PAYE basis. This means that workers could still have the opportunity at the end of the year to process business, genuine related business expenses on their self-assessment. Businesses can also retain and are subject to VAT, um, whereas other pay-as-you-earn mechanisms that Chris and I speak about today, um, VAT is dealt with by another partner within the supply chain. So VAT is still onerous of that limited company that's engaged for this assignment. Workers who have several sources of income, whether that be rental accommodation, savings, investment, may well filter their income through the limited company. And the limited company isn't simply a vehicle for being paid for the contract assignment that they're working through an employment business for. So you, you've got to think what type of workers would want this type of arrangement and why would an agency want to engage in this way? Well, ultimately, it's about having options and it's also about making sure that this leverages some sort of um, payroll mechanism for, for different types of workers. To put into context, um, Giant currently have a couple of thousand workers currently engaged via our I-35 fee pay model. And this has significantly grown since the off payroll changes both back in 2017 and in 2021. Giant will sit in the contract chain and will sit between the employment business or recruitment agency and the workers limited company. We will also act as the fee payer, adding a layer of financial stability and risk mitigation across the supply chain. For those that have got background in I-35 and probably feel like they've spent a lot of time on it over the last number of years, the fee payer is the, is the intermediary that pays um, the limited company. And there is an element of risk there if that payment is made incorrectly or isn't made uh, the right levels of deduction. So with Giant sat in that supply chain, we, we are adding a layer of um, Uh, mitigation um, to both the client and the recruitment agency. If agencies on today's webinar don't have the capacity to provide this I-35 fee payer or are concerned about rolling out this solution um, and the risks associated with it, please do speak to Chris, reach out to us on today's webinar or give us a call afterwards. As this has been seen with other businesses as a key solution for certain types of white collar, highly paid individuals both being retained on assignments, but also attracting new talent. If you've got the opportunity to keep these workers as a limited company, the kudos that comes with it may well be the difference between attracting that talented worker or not. For those that have spoken to workers over the last number of years, if you tell them that they are on a PAYE mechanism through Umbrella or pay as you earn, you may well get a different response to be able to tell them that they can still get paid into their own limited company. And, and there's that kudos, there's that responsibility. And also, you know, a, a lot of these workers were probably engaged as a limited company prior to the off payroll changes. So if you can keep some sort of consistency, um, then it has made a huge difference in certain aspects of the supply chain that giant working.
Amazing. Thank you so much for explaining all that to us, Michael. We're going to come back to you now, Chris. Um, can you please go on to explain what we mean by EOR and then also how this differs from PEO? Of course, yeah. Thank you, Michael, for the detail there. Um, so EOR stands for Employer of Record. Uh, and EOR assumes all responsibility for the people who work for them. They are, in effect, the employer. They'll handle almost every task related to hiring, termination, the processing of payroll and everything else in between. Businesses will often use an EOR when expanding internationally to help hire interna international talent, perform background checks and also to manage the payroll. As an immediate comparison of EOR versus PEO, for example, the PEO becomes a co-employer, as I explained earlier. They specialise in managing HR related tasks like payroll, services, benefit plan administration and workers compensation administration too, while clients and agencies will continue them to manage the day to day activities of their employees. When looking to hire contingent workers, most of the employee relationship is managed by the EOR. They'll assume responsibility for hiring and employment contracts as well as benefits, insurance, and even business registration. This can be a good option for employers who want to enter a country, but don't necessarily want to set up shop there, which is why it's often associated with international payroll in the contingent worker space. When you work with a PEO as a direct comparison, you'll retain more HR responsibilities. The PEO offers valuable advice and access to services, again, like the insurance or benefit plans, but the agency and client generally have full control over hiring and employment contracts. A PEO is also often viewed as the better choice when you want to stay in the driver's seat, but also expand your HR capabilities. They are there to help you maintain compliance with local employment laws and enhance your HR capabilities, potentially making a PEO a better long-term solution than an EOR. If you just want to get people hired on quickly, an EOR might be the right move for your business, and again, it also reduces your liabilities when you're looking to enter a new market. Since they assume the employment relationship, the ER alone is responsible for compliance, insurance and employment contracts, which minimises the red tape and regulation you would otherwise need to navigate yourself when looking to hire internationally. Again, in terms of a, a case study here at Giant, um, We've got another employment business who we've been working with recently who in the last 12 months have leveraged themselves from operating just as a, a standard search and selection firm into a master vendor in the chemical manufacturing space. This transition has obviously allowed them much greater control on the recruitment process for the client and obviously an increased guaranteed revenue. But it's also placed an ever increasing demand on their internal resources. They've reached out to my team directly to help support the growth of our global EOR service for the Nordics, Netherlands and the USA specifically to allow them not only to service the client's requirements in the UK, but also internationally. IR35, as Michael's discussed, is obviously specific to the UK, um, but the legislation in itself is also seen across the globe in different forms. Tax authorities are wise to disguised employment for contingent workers, and they specifically needed a scalable solution to support contract roles on an employed basis here. Giant Global have helped provide an affordable EOR solution which keeps the agency partner positioned as the master vendor outside the UK and ensures compliance in all local tax juris jurisdictions that they serve. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. Michael and Chris, thank you both for your insights so far. We're going to keep you on your toes for a little bit longer with a live Q&A. Um, for any of the audience, uh, this is your last chance to get in your questions. Um, so feel free to do that now. And I'm going to begin to put some questions to our key speakers. So our first question is, uh, Someone has said, I want to continue working through my limited company so that I can accept work inside and outside IR35. What are my best options? Happy to pick that one up. Thanks, Betty. Um, I think 
this is very similar to that of um, the discussion around um, I-35 fee payer slash the deemed model. Um, limited company isn't just a vehicle for the assignment schedule ahead of you. It may well be a, a vehicle, an, an overarching umbrella mechanism for other forms of income like property, savings, investments. Um, and ultimately, workers um, can still be paid through that limited company, um, but they are taxed on a pay as you earn basis. Now, some employment businesses will be able to provide the D model directly and deduct the tax and national insurance at source before paying into that limited company. Um, some employment businesses don't have the capability or don't want to be able to do that uh, arrangement. So giant, like we do on a number of, um, of facilities, is that we'll sit in the supply chain and we will receive the assignment income from the employment business, we'll make the necessary PAYE deductions, and also um, make the payment net into the business bank account plus the VAT. Amazing. Thank you so much. Just locating question number two. Um, we've had a couple of questions on the IR35 fee payer topic. Um, so the second question is just Sorry, does fee payer work with paying on milestone <laughs> deliverables outside of IR35? Uh, I suppose with it being on the same topic, yes. Um, you know the answer for that one? Yep. Um, so ultimately, I, if you're usually on a milestones, um, that's typically um, based on uh, deliverables. And ultimately, there's a high indication of that work being outside of IR35. Um, if it's inside I-35, then again, the model still works um, and either being payable directly via the employment business or, or via an intermediary like Giant. Um, typically, though, however, if you are on deliverables and milestones, there's a high chance that because you're taking financial risk, um, there's a high chance that the role should be deemed outside of I-35 and you'd be paid gross as normal um, and you'd be able to deal with your own tax affairs at the end of the year. Um, amazing. Thank you. And while you're on an I-35, 35 fee pair role. I've got one more for you here. Um, so are there many organisations that offer IR35 fee pair to contractors? We found it difficult to find any umbrella companies that offer this. Michael, I'll look to take this one just because um, you know, with our background with where we've worked previously, um, there was a high concentration of, of, of ultimately PSC contractors. It was mainly an accountancy provider for PSCs that Michael and I worked at for many years. And Although considered the deemed model, um, I think many payroll companies have um, ultimately turned away from this because on face value, um, the take home pay for the contractor is, is very comparable to other PAYE options that we've mentioned, including Umbrella. Um, where it does come into its own is the element around which Michael's discussed around other modes of income or other modes of uh, pensions may be set up as a company. They don't want to switch to personal. Um, and also the, the real main benefit here for the contractors is that tax relief on genuine business expenses that they can look to claim from their accountants at, at year end. Um, it is difficult to find payroll companies that will offer it. Many will just tend to stick to the bread and butter of umbrella, which is what they know. But obviously Giant as a market leader is, is keen to support our clients, be that agencies or or end hires directly, um, you know, with solutions that, as Michael Lapley put when he gave his overview, you know, we're not trying to, I suppose, turn up new ground with the solution. But what we are saying to our partners is, look, if you're set up with the fee payer solution with us, it's there and it's available for contractors who don't want to operate down, maybe umbrella PAYE, and they do want to keep, you know, operational. It might be for a short term contract, it might be much longer term, but ultimately they want to keep being paid through into their limited company. I have seen quite recently, actually, there's been one um, agency partner that we work with that actually offers the deemed model themselves, but that is very rare and out of the hundreds that, that Michael and I obviously look after between us and our teams. That is the only one and, and out there in the market. I think Giant are a market leader with, with this type of solution that we offer. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we're now moving on to PEO. So does the PEO option run through Giant's PAYE account or our PAYE account? Uh, I will answer this one as well, if you don't mind, Michael, but feel free to chip in just because of a, a, a recent uh, solution that we've we've ultimately tailored for, for one of our larger clients. When when operating with the PEO, 
through Giant, Giant will remain the, the EOR. So the actual PAYE reference will be Giant. Now, that is for PAY, PEO solely. However, what we have managed to put together, together for this particular client is a tailored outsourced PAYE solution that runs on their own PAYE reference. So we can do that. It is non-standard, but it is something that we have available. And so if that is an option that you might be looking for, because we do know that some clients, specifically probably internationally based clients, will again in their contract stipulate that the partner, the agency partner that's supplying the resource needs to run the PAYE on their own reference. And that's what happened in this scenario. So um, we can do it. It isn't typical of our PEO standard based solution. However, it's something that if it is a requirement for anybody on the call, whether that be with an existing client that you have or any new larger clients that you're looking to win over, you know, the next six, 12 months, please get in touch with me and Michael and we can open those conversations as to how that works with you. Amazing. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, so on to the next question. Where do sole traders fall into this? Many companies do not allow sole traders, but interested to understand how these could be managed. Um, yeah, happy for taking a little bit of an update on that. Thanks, Betty. Um, so I think sole traders are uh, a bit of an enigma when it comes to employment agencies. Um, we all know sole traders exist and we all know that typically they engage directly with the clients you know if you look at your typical plasterer plumber roofer that you have in your community they may be well be engaged as a sole trader potentially limited company but sole trader um i think there's been a very clear outlook from the revenue is that they want to make sure that the right person is paying the right levels of tax uh, and that's whether they're a an admin clerical worker that's paye or whether it's a site manager to CIS having a 20% deduction through the CIS UTR number. Um, from the last 10, 15 years working with recruitment agencies, sole traders are very, very lightly used um, because of the requirements of tax being applied. Um, even if the worker wants to be paid as a sole trader, um, the recruitment agency has to go through the relative SDC checks, supervision, direction and control checks, and ultimately what that means is that they're relying on that worker to pay the tax and I or to relevant tax and national insurance at the end of the year. If the tax and I isn't applied, then ultimately the liability can be passed up the supply chain to the agency and or the client and debt transfer will, will take over. So there is occasions and it also comes into certain sectors. I think if you're in the media sector and, and other sectors where maybe sole traders have been typically engaged, then certain businesses will take that commercial risk that they've done all of the checks that they need to. They believe that the worker is outside of SDC and they may have some sort of requirement to pay that tax at the end of the year. Um, but I can't see the sole trader um, avenue expanding more than what it is at the moment with recruitment agencies. I think if they go direct to clients, then that may well be a different answer. But for now, I can't see the sole trader area or uh, engagement model increasing more than what it is at the moment. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, one more question here is, due to the new legislation coming in under the Labour government, one of our consultants is looking to close down their limited company. Will they then be able to set up a new limited company so that they can still operate outside of IR35 or how will that work? Do you want to take that, Chris? Or I can do, yeah. I, th I think it's dependent upon how the individual has shut down their personal services limited company. For example, there's something called, um, but they keep changing the name, so this is probably still the right acronym, a member's voluntary liquidation. So if you've got retained funds in your limited company account, you can benefit from an MVL, which ultimately reduces your gross taxable paying over to the revenue with regards to, you know, having 100, 200, 300,000 into an account, for example. What that does put constraints on is a contractor opening up a new personal services limited company within the duration of two years. They could still do it. However, there's a high risk on them as an individual of doing such an operation. So with, with that one that, that Toby's put in there, it's highly dependable on the exact mechanism that the contractor has used to shut down their limited company. And ultimately, it'd be a question back to them for their accountant to answer on their behalf. Um, Again, if they have done and benefited from anything that would provide them with a much greater, well, 
a much less of a great tax burden like an MVL. It's definitely worth them seeking independent tax advice from their accountant or a third party because vested interest, their accountant may want them to open up another company if recently shut down. Amazing. Thanks so much, Chris. Just want to pass over to Michael because I know a couple of people are putting in a couple of other questions in the chat. Um, what what have Labour put in their manifesto which is going to affect worker rights? Can you update us on that? Yeah, thanks, Betty. And, and thanks, everyone, for the for the questions coming in. Um, we can see them all on this topic. And I, I, um, I had a meeting this morning, actually, with a, um, a very large recruitment business who and I've had similar conversations with agencies over the last sort of three to six months. So a part of sort of Labour's manifesto and we've been getting a sort of external update from Osborne Clark and other solicitors and lawyers is that obviously they want to try and um, make changes to, to worker rights and, and how recruitment agencies engage workers. And a couple of points to consider. Um, uh, day one employment rights. So you know, Labour advocating for rights like unfair dismissal protection, flexible working and parental leave to apply from day one of employment. Um, other considerations will be the right to request a contract that matches the actual hours work. So this effectively removes zero hour contracts. And also reclassification of a worker status. Uh, Labour intends to streamline employment statuses, so possibly, um, and I am using the word possibly, merging categories of employee and worker. Um, now, this naturally would bring agency workers under the same protections as full time employees, uh, meaning greater accountability for agencies um, to provide full employment rights. So I think just to summarise what, what that typically means is that if you're an agency that have got a population of pay your own workers, there's angles for considerations of how best to engage with them workers going forward under the new Labour manifesto. Um, Giant have got, as we've explained today on today's webinar with Chris and Betty, we've we've got a range of solutions which not only um, outsources risk and helps support the supply chain, but also, um, depending on specific examples and scenarios, we may well be able to add a layer of commercial benefit as well to the employment business. So, um, you know, don't just think of Giant as an umbrella company. Um, unfortunately, we get stuck with that um, brush quite a lot. Um, you know, hopefully today's given everybody a bit more of an insight into the the types of solutions and the the ways that Giant can help support and navigate through legislative changes and how we have done also over the last twenty years. So, you know, if anybody does have any follow up questions, any other queries regarding how Giant can support these potential um changes that the government are looking to move forward on i think we're likely to get an update end of october so it's 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 pretty quick um then please do reach out to the team here at giant um chris or, or myself thank you so much michael we're just going to have one more question now um chris as you looked at the kind of global outlook of this at the end this might be one for you um so someone said i am the director of um, a limited company and I want to raise an invoice from my company to my customer in the USA and get paid into my business account. Um, will that trigger IR35? Mm. There's a couple of follow up questions that I'd need to ask here in terms of will that trigger IR35? Um, number one is IR35 is obviously a UK legislative piece. If the client that you're working for is based within the UK, and an SDS has been issued to state that the role that you're going to be working through is classified as inside of IR35 or conversely, and again, I'll use the inverted commas here now, the client has got a blanket ban view approach in terms of their task, tax risk view. Um, it needs to be a question back with regards to what is the actual SDS for the role that you're going to be completing? If that role is classified as inside of IR35, regardless of the currency that you're going to be paying in, you'd be inside of IR35. So it's a question back to understand a little bit more around the actual details with regards to, to this question that I've answered best as I can, Betty, but. Yeah, amazing. Um, one of the follow-up questions to that was, um, can Giant help support this particular person? Um, I'd like to confidently say yes. Um, so if I pop your email in the chat, Chris, and they send over their phone number, I'm assuming you'll be very happy to follow up with their chat afterwards. Absolutely. Um, 
so that's that's what we'll do next um and then to all of you we really really appreciate your time um we yeah we really hope that you've got something useful out of this session um i'll follow up tomorrow with the recording so you can re-watch or pass it on to anyone that might find this useful um and we hope to see you on future webinars um and we're always here to um help you with any of these solutions thank you so much thanks everyone thanks all thanks for joining